This morning, the government's Rwanda policy was in shreds. This evening, the Prime Minister said he'd introduce a new treaty with Rwanda to make the policy safe and introduce emergency legislation, saying, quote, I will not allow a foreign court to block these flights. It's the latest government policy to try and stop the boats. Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick tells us the government actually won today. On the programme, we'll hear from one of the asylum seekers whose case was at the heart of this legal battle. He came to the UK on a small boat in 2022 after he says he was tortured in his home country. But why the UK when he travelled through multiple safe countries to get here? But you don't speak French. If you don't speak the language, you can't find a job. And, and for Labour, Peter Kyle is here after 56 Labour MPs defied Sir Keir Starmer by voting for a ceasefire in Gaza. That's the biggest rebellion of his leadership so far. Also tonight, the Prime Minister says he's achieved one of his five pledges, halving inflation by the end of the year. We've been back to Knowsley, the second most deprived borough in England, to see if life is any less of a struggle. The bills are just going up and up, and all the food, although it's gone up, it's some ridiculous as prices. It's not going to come down. Everything that goes up doesn't come down. Good evening. The Prime Minister claims he does have a plan B to get flights off to Rwanda after all. After five justices at the Supreme Court today ruled the government's policy was unlawful, because of the risk of asylum seekers being forcibly sent back from Rwanda to their own country, where they could be tortured or killed. The judgment read aloud by the president of the Supreme Court this morning was devastating. The deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, Lee Anderson, said the government should put the planes in the air to Rwanda anyway and ignore the highest court in this country. In response to the ruling, Rishi Sunak said he disagreed with it but accepted it promised to introduce emergency legislation and claimed he would not allow a foreign court to block these flights, but didn't say how he'd stop a foreign court from doing that. In a moment, we'll hear from the Immigration Minister. We'll talk live to Labour and hear from an asylum seeker at the heart of this case. First, here's Nick. We will pass new laws to stop small boats, making sure that if you come to this country illegally, you are detained and swiftly removed. A defining pledge by a Prime Minister expecting to be judged on its success. Today, over to the judges who said no. The plan to send illegal migrants to Rwanda was ruled unlawful, partly on the principle of non refoulement that refugees must not be returned to their country of origin if their life or freedom would be threatened. That is guaranteed under the UN Refugee Convention. The judges also raised concerns about compliance with international agreements on civil rights, torture and the European Convention on Human Rights. Today the Supreme Court has judged that the Rwanda policy requires a set of changes in order to be lawful. To the Prime Minister, who announced a three-point plan to answer the Supreme Court. A new international treaty with Rwanda to protect those sent there against being removed. Emergency legislation to confirm that Rwanda is a safe country. And stopping the European Court of Human Rights from blocking Rwanda flights, perhaps by disapplying certain aspects of the convention. When I said I would stop the boats, I meant it. Today's judgment has not weakened my resolve, it has only hardened it. Labour branded the plan a failure and used strong language to claim that the new Home Secretary is no fan. He distanced himself from it and his predecessor's language on it. He may even, on occasion, have privately called it batshit. But he and I agree. We need action to stop boat crossings that are undermining border security and putting lives at risk. We need a properly controlled and managed system for asylum and refugees. Home Office sources use stronger language in private to deny this. And a guarded welcome for Rishi Sunak's emergency legislation from a key figure 
on the right. We've heard from the Prime Minister today that he is committed to doing whatever it takes. He said that before and then today he said that he would review our domestic and our international legal framework and if necessary change them in order to see the policy which he remains committed to, to see that policy through. So I'm encouraged by that but the principle of sticking with the Rwanda policy, sticking with the principle that if you come to this country illegally you cannot have a right to stay here which is the absolutely unacceptable reality that we have at the moment. It should not be possible to come to this country illegally and then stay here indefinitely. We've got to be able to remove people. Esther McVeigh. Oh, hello. A challenging day for the government. And after that judgment today, does the Minister for Common Sense think we should pull out of the ECHR? I will speak with all my colleagues. It's not just about what I think. It's about what everything, everybody else thinks and fundamentally what the Prime Minister thinks. So give me time to take on board that judgment, but obviously work with my colleagues. But pulling out is something that you'd want to be talking to colleagues about. We'll be looking at all the options and what is a realistic option. But obviously we want to deliver the policy for this country and we're looking at immigration and how we get those numbers down. And it is a big setback today, is it, for the government? One step at a time, one step at a time. Deputy Prime Minister, are you disappointed by the ruling? And do you think, Deputy Prime Minister, that the time has come to pull out of the ECHR? You could tell this was a difficult day for Rishi Sunak when he toured the Commons Tea Room shortly after Prime Minister's questions. And then this evening, during a series of votes on the King's speech, he walked round and round the division lobbies with leading members of the Tory right. I've got a plan, he reassured them. I'm told the Prime Minister was heard politely, but with a dose of scepticism. A time for reflection in the heart of government. And tonight, a time for a new battle plan. Nick Watt, just before we came on air, I spoke to the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick. Well, good evening, Victoria. It is absolutely critical that flights go off to Rwanda in the spring. The Prime Minister emphasised that, and that is what we're setting out to achieve. Of course, we're disappointed by the judgment at the Supreme Court, but we've been working on a plan B for a long time, and that includes, as the Prime Minister said, a treaty, which we're in the final stages of negotiating, and an accompanying piece of emergency legislation that sorts out the remaining issues, determines Rwanda as a safe country, and ensures that the endless cycle of legal disputes and challenges finally comes to an end. Once we've got that on the statute book, then I'm confident if it's sufficiently comprehensive, that we can get those flights off, and we have to do that in the spring of next year. But you can't guarantee it? Well, I think I've been very clear with you, Victoria. That is what we're setting out to do. And I think we have absolutely... Which means you can't guarantee it? We, well, we have to do it. It's but you can't guarantee it? Imperative. I mean, there is a difference. Voters aren't stupid. Well, that's what I'm setting out to achieve. And the litmus test of both the treaty and the piece of emergency legislation is can together they ensure we get the flights off to Rwanda by the spring. We must do that and everyone will have to judge the seriousness of those two things by whether we can meet that objective. The Prime Minister also said in his press conference this evening, I will not allow a foreign court to block these flights. But he didn't say that he would pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights, overseen by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Why didn't Rishi Sunak say he would pull out of the ECHR? Well, well firstly, uh, neither Prime Minister and I can uh, go into the details of the bill because we're in the final stages of drafting it right now. And that's for an understandable reason, not because we've been sitting on our hands, but because we had to wait for the Supreme Court's judgment and the exact issues that they raised with our policy so that we can craft the bill appropriately. Now, I, I, I'm not going to speculate on the exact um, contents of the bill, but le let me say this. The Prime Minister and I have said for a long time that we'll do whatever it takes to get the flights off to Rwanda, and we both meant it. I'm determined to deliver on that. OK, that's that interesting. That that's doesn't interesting necessarily you, mean well, leaving... Uh, uh, or, or moving away from our international obligations. But it does mean that we have to end the cycle of legal challenges and ensure that this matter is finally concluded. And so the bill has to do that. When I look at 
some of what the five justices said about your policy. And they pretty much repeated what the Court of Appeal judges said. Rwanda has little or no experience of considering asylum applications from the relevant countries. Where Rwanda has declined asylum applications, no written reasons have been provided and there's no right of appeal. Rwanda has a surprisingly high rejection rate for claimants from known conflict zones. Rwanda has forcibly expelled some asylum seekers in the interest of maintaining close diplomatic relations with neighbouring countries. I mean, it, they absolutely demolished your policy. How did anyone in government, the Prime Minister, you, your former boss, the Home Secretary, ever think you were going to win this on appeal? Well, you've got to remember that we won uh, on the divisional court and then at the Court of Appeal, uh, we lost on a split judgment and the most senior judge uh, on that case, uh, that occasion, strongly supported our argument. Sure, so it's, but you lost two uh, to one. And, and Victoria, we have won on the most important question of all, which is the principle, which is that a country such as the United Kingdom can work with another partner such as Rwanda to uh, send asylum seekers there. There's just a question now about whether or not we have sufficient assurances that that country won't refool people, send people against their will back to their country Mr. of origin. Jeremy, that's forgive an unsafe me. Country. That is incredible spin. You have not won on the main principle. You have lost all five justices, ruled it was unlawful because it was not safe to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. That is a demolition of your Rwanda policy. No, I mean, Victoria, I'm afraid that's not a correct reading of what's happened. The central argument at the heart of the whole case over the course of the last 18 months has been whether or not you, it is consistent with the Refugee Convention that a country like the UK can work with a third country and send asylum seekers there for their claims to be heard and for individuals uh, to ultimately be settled in that country. We have won that core point. What remains is a question about whether uh, the assurances from the government of Rwanda are sufficient to satisfy uh, the UK's uh, legal framework that individuals will not be refooled okay. uh, to their country of origin. You said you've been working on this uh, new Rwanda treaty for some time. How long? Uh, for several months. Um, we so Suella Braverman would have known about that, would have been involved in that? She was. The former Home Secretary and I worked very closely together on that. It was the prudent thing to do. We uh, believed that we would win in the Supreme Court. Their arguments were very strong, uh, but we obviously had to produce uh, a plan B. Why did she write in her letter to Rishi Sunak yesterday, or why did she seem to suggest that there was no plan B? Well, the former Home Secretary and I worked on a plan B, and that is what we're now in the process of implementing. So was she lying and in that letter? Uh, no, she wasn't, but what we now need to do is take the work that she and I did over the course of the last few months and put that into practice. And that means concluding this treaty, uh, which is very well advanced, we have teams working on it as I speak, and then accompany it with this piece of emergency legislation. Do you agree with her when she describes Rishi Sunak for essentially blocking, as she put it, her suggestions and saying that his leadership style was uncertain, weak and lacking in the qualities of leadership this country needs? No, I think that uh, the Prime Minister has been uh, very supportive on this issue and has done more than any of his recent predecessors. And in fact, you see that from the results that we've achieved together as a team. I am absolutely focused on getting the flights off in the spring and the legislation, the treaty must achieve that. Thank you very much for talking to us this evening. Thanks. Let's talk now to Conservative MP Neil O'Brien, who is a supporter of the government's Rwanda policy and asked Rishi Sunak in the House of Commons today to consider overriding the Human Rights Act to ensure people could be deported there. Hello to you, Mr O'Brien. Do you understand what the Rishi Sunak, what Robert Jenrick is suggesting here? Yes, I do. And I think it's absolutely right that we should do whatever it takes in order to stop the small boats. So because it? fundamentally, the situation is we've had 112,000 people come across in small boats now. And that is effectively just tearing up the rule of law in this country. You just can't have any sense of fairness if those who uh, come here legally and play by the rules see people just forcing their way into their country and then being able to stay. Our ability to deport people has absolutely collapsed over recent years, and that's because of the build-up of case law and interpretation 
of uh, various uh, different judicial instruments so over what time. Are they suggesting? So uh, what I, uh, we heard the Prime Minister talk about uh, this evening is uh, uh, both taking steps to uh, respond to the Supreme Court's challenge directly by having this new treaty uh, with Rwanda, but also doing something which I think is more important, which is uh, to have a second piece of legislation that will protect that and protect our ability to deport people from various different avenues of legal challenge. Because what we've seen time and time again is... So, so, people so not are pulling out of the ECHR, but what, overriding elements of it? I think, I think that is the suggestion, one of the suggestions the Prime Minister made, and I think he's right. Has that been done anywhere else? I think he's right to uh, think about every conceivable option here, because people seeing year after year people coming across the channel, they know it's unfair, every poll shows that it's overwhelmingly hated by the British public and well, they want us have, to fix it. You have a very long time to fix this, haven't you? And we've been trying to fix it for many years, and today we see the latest instalment of that, with the courts once again blocking us from doing the things that we need to do in order to get people leaving the country. So these are, these not, are English you, courts you blocking you for safety reasons. They, they are a mix of various international agreements, some of which are very, very old, some of which go back to 1951, 1967, and so on and so forth. That we've, that we've signed when, up to. And we signed up to them. Some and of them we, we even wrote. And, and, when we, and some of them we even wrote. And when we wrote them, there was no sense for the people signing them that they would in future be used in the way that they are now used every day, which is to stop people from being deported. To I mean, stop the people 51, being tortured, the 51, from being sent back to their home the 51, country, to, be, to stop them being tortured the or possibly killed. So the people who are coming here, let's be clear, are coming here from France, an extremely safe country, right? So they're not going to be tortured or killed in France. Many of those people, some of those people will be genuine refugees. I have every sympathy for genuine refugees. I've had refugees live in my house. But... A lot of them are not legitimate uh, refugees. They're coming as economic migrants and they're forcing their way into the country and then they know that they can stay because our ability to deport anybody has been totally hobbled by the build-up of case law over time. And we well, see it every why, time. Why, we why see people being... Then, excuse, sorry to interrupt. Why is the grant rate then for people coming from Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, around 75%? So the Home Office is agreeing they're genuine refugees. There's, That's most of them. The, the grant rate used to be much lower for all of these things. So our grant rate is one of the most generous in the world. So and the UK I, system I, is extremely generous. And that's down to the generous. Home Office. But a lot of these people, if you think about where they're coming from, so a thousand of the people who came across the channel last year were from India. It's the world's largest democracy. It's a superpower. There are many safe and legal ways to get here from India. That is not a legitimate way to arrive in this country, just to force your way in by crossing the channel in the hands of a people smuggler. If you think about some of the other What countries. I'm saying to you is, irrespective of how people have arrived, the grant rate for people from places like it's, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria is very it's, high. It's not irrespective of the way people arrive. We can't have a situation in which people know that if they pay a people smuggler, and they get across the channel, they've got a 98% chance of staying here. That is just not how we can carry but it. That's people, because the people, Home Office people, says they can stay people, here because people, they've looked at the criteria and agreed that they're well, genuine they, refugees. They've looked at our current set of laws, and under our current set of laws and the current build-up of case law over time, many of which are things that have never been intended by the original framers of these pieces of legislation, it has become increasingly impossible to deport everyone. Everyone can see it. Everyone can see again and again that people are uh, put into custody, they have umpteen appeals, so if you start with 400 people, by the evening of the flight you've got 100. In their pyjamas, lawyers are getting these people off the plane and you end up with about two people being deported. It is shameful, it's unacceptable, it doesn't work. If you want to be a sovereign country, if you want to be a democracy, frankly, you've got to be able to have the right to deport people who shouldn't be here. And that right has been eroded over time okay. by the build-up of case law, and we've just got to fix that. It's just not fair. OK, thank you very much for being with us thank you. and for talking to our audience. Uh, right, Seam is here and you've been looking into the emergency legislation. Talk us through the possibilities. So, um, Victoria, the emergency legislation will confirm that Rwanda is safe according to the Prime Minister. Now, that would obviously contradict what the Supreme Court ruled this morning. The legislation, like all legislation, will have to go through both houses. This could take as little as a few weeks, but because this is highly contentious, it may well take a lot longer. Now, if it gets bogged down in the House of Lords, the government won't have the Parliament Act to force it through. This bit is important. It can delay what's not in the manifesto by up to a year. And there is little the government can do about that. If it passes, the courts would be bound by the Act of Parliament, but the government is still a signatory of the Refugee Convention, which prevents asylum seekers being sent back to their country of origin, if in danger there. So the UK would be in breach of international law. And what about the European Court of Human Rights? Well, you're just talking to Neil about that there. The ECHR could put interim measures in place to stop 
any flights. Um, but the Illegal Migration Act means the UK government could ignore it, although that would be a breach of international law. The Prime Minister hinted at that earlier in that press conference this afternoon. He said he will not allow a foreign court to block these flights. However, asylum seekers could seek a judgment from the ECHR. That probably wouldn't delay the process, I'm told by lawyers, if the government was determined to go ahead. But they also tell me it might lead to an order to bring the refugees back or pay damages. If the government persisted, it could lead to an ex exit from the convention. Thank you very much, Seema. Thank you. I spoke today to one of the asylum seekers involved in the Supreme Court case. He's 49. He arrived in the UK on a small boat in 2022 and found himself, he says, a few months later being given an airline ticket to Rwanda. He asked us to hide his identity and where he comes from originally in case it jeopardises his claim for asylum. His words are spoken by a translator. He explains what the decision today could mean for him and why he first fled his home country. I was with others detained because of our background and religion. I was handcuffed for nine hours and standing up while I am handcuffed. I was subject to uh, strikes and physical torture. Eventually you travelled to France and you got on a small boat to cross the channel to come to the UK, arriving in spring 2022. Can I ask you what that journey was like? You know, we were in that boat for seven long hours and even the motor broke down of the boat. So it was really, really uh, a frightening experience. Why did you want to risk your life getting to the UK in that way? Well, I had to. I had to go to somewhere safe. Everyone was talking positively about the UK. Having said that, after my arrival, I was detained for three odd months. France is a safe country, though. But you don't speak French. If you don't speak the language, you can't find a job. You don't speak French. You don't speak English. Is that right? Here, at least you can go to a language school to learn, but there you can't. It's very difficult there. Can I ask how long you were detained for? I remember being in Dover for three days and then boarded a bus, a coach, and taken to that deport centre. We received a letter informing us that the government is intending to send you to Rwanda. At that point, did you, was there any part of you wishing that you had never left your home country? Bale. Yes. I had a pack of tablets been given to me for my mental health issues and I had a pack of paracetamol. I took them all. You would rather have died than been put on that flight? Yes. Are you relieved that, the, that your life was saved? Today, after the court hearing. Yes, I am. What would be wrong with being flown from the UK to Rwanda to have your asylum case processed? It's a chaos in Rwanda. There's no law and order in Rwanda. There's no legitimate government. There is some law and order. There is a legitimate government. I wonder if you could explain what it is you would fear about being in Rwanda. Check the internet, you know. You see killing, murders, everyday gangs. The government just, just serves themselves, you know. Your reaction to the fact that the Rwanda plan has been found unlawful? 
I am very pleased whether I will benefit from this decision or not. But why should these vulnerable people be sent to Rwanda? Sir Keir Starmer has suffered a major rebellion tonight with eight shadow ministers leaving the front bench over his stance on the Israel-Gaza war. In total, 56 Labour MPs voted for an SNP motion calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Labour had ordered its MPs to abstain, with front benchers facing the sack for supporting it. Sir Keir Starmer has instead backed pauses in the conflict to deliver aid. In a statement tonight, he said, I regret that some colleagues felt unable to support the position, but I wanted to be clear about where I stood and I will stand. Leadership is about doing the right thing. Nick is here. Well, Victoria, this is the largest rebellion that Keir Starmer has faced. Around about 30% of his MPs voted with the SNP. That's 56 out of 198 Labour MPs. And you could see in the run-up to the vote that the leadership knew that it wasn't going well. Shadow cabinet ministers were talking in corridors with potential rebels. But interestingly, after the vote, the atmosphere wasn't angry. It was one of deep sadness. I saw tears. I saw Labour MPs who'd taken different views hugging each other. And interestingly, not many rebels taking to the airwaves tonight. And the atmosphere in that group was really summed up by Jess Phillips, who resigned from the Shadow Home Office team. She said she resigned with great regret. She looks forward to supporting Keir Starmer become Prime Minister, but she said she had to vote with her head and with her heart. I did find one of the rebels, and this is what Naz Shah had to say to me. You know, the, the idea that a child is killed every 10 minutes in Gaza, you know, Palestinian children are being robbed, that is a ch but uh, Palestine is becoming a graveyard for children. These are not light terms. How can I not support a call for an immediate ceasefire? Well, let's talk now to Labour MP and Shadow Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, Peter Kyle. I mean, can you answer Naz Shah's question? How can you not support calls for a ceasefire? Because what we have to do as an aspiring party of government is do what could lead to a permanent end to the conflict. Now, we know that calling for a ceasefire at the moment won't deliver a ceasefire. We also know, looking back in history, if you look at 2012, when there was a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, Hamas broke that ceasefire two years later. And in that two years, they had rearmed and they came back with a counterattack that was more vicious than the previous one. But so Jess we understand said in her resignation letter tonight that, that she believes that the military action which we're seeing now in Gaza puts at risk any um, potential for peace in the future because the military action is so intense. What we're seeing, the war that is unfolding between Hamas and Israel is putting at, at risk long-term political solutions. There's no question about that. The, the thing that we're debating is actually what these immediate next steps are. Because there were two motions tonight. There, there were two uh, motions that were de voted on. The first was a Labour motion, which every single Labour MP voted for, which caused for a cessation of, uh, of the, the war uh, and the steps taking that we could take to practically deliver it. Now, there were some people that did want to go further and they wanted to call for an immediate ceasefire, but that, we just believe, is just not practical at the moment. Now, what, we, what you saw and what Nick described there is the emotion that's driving all of this. There are both sides. We deeply, deeply care about the humanitarian catastrophe that's unfolding. Well, that's but we, that's we need... Said. Had we called for a ceasefire yesterday... 144 children might still be alive. But I don't think anybody believes that anybody here unilaterally calling for a ceasefire would actually deliver a ceasefire on the ground. Okay. Just tonight, just while probably while we've been on air, the United Nations has now passed a resolution calling for a humanitarian pause. So we now see the, the UN, UN, Security Council the UN we now see the UN Security Council, the US and all of our G7 partners calling for humanitarian pauses as the first immediate step. If we go in line with that, if we stand shoulder to shoulder with our international community, then we can have influence. Voters don't like divided parties. Do you agree you're a divided party tonight? Well, well, right now, actually, what we see is a party that came together over a way forward. Some people wanted to go fur further. But if you were talking about a divided party, when you see the Conservative Party right now, okay. with the row I'm it's having... I'm going to pause you there. I've, I, I I've talked why. to two Conservatives yeah. already yeah. tonight. But, but let's, let's talk about very, your party. Let, yeah, uh, no, there completely. is division in your party. As Nick said, nearly 30% of the party defied their leader. 
we all came... What does that say about discipline when you are trying to present yourself to voters as a government in waiting? Well, unlike the Conservative Party that is I'm going side about to Labour. side... Yeah, unlike the Conservative Party that's going side to side on all of its policies, we are still have one single policy led by our leader, uh, and what he's doing is showing that if he becomes Prime Minister, that he will lead forward with unanimity with our international partners. Now, but, but not through all with of his this, own party. Well, look at how he's led through this, because the first set of challenges that we had when I was uh, last speaking to you was, well, he's allowing all these, the, the, these, these backbenchers and other MPs to talk about ceasefire. Why isn't he sacking them? He went through a period of listening, engaging, and, and I say it is a strength of the Labour Party that we have both traditions. We have people of Muslim faith and we have Jewish faith within our party. So we are trying, and Keir has been trying really hard to bring them together and not exacerbate the divisions. But the time comes when a vote in Parliament happens. We didn't choose to have this vote today, but the time comes when you have a vote in Parliament and you, he, as leader, the person who wants to be the Prime Minister of our country, has to lead from the front and be decisive. That's what we've seen today. Okay. But our policy is unchanged. He is leading from the front. He's listened. Uh, we are supporting humanitarian pauses. We want to move to a cessation of the yeah. conflict Let me ask and you then, then to a political you, you call, resolution. You're calling for a longer humanitarian pause. How mm. long is a longer humanitarian for pause? A, so well, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and judge that. I've been an aid worker in, in my earlier life. Is it a day? We, well, is it two it days? It is whatever is needed to get aid to everywhere it is needed. Aid as in fuel, as in medicine uh, and in water and the aid workers to deliver that. To deliver that. So we need to work in cooperation and allow the aid workers to do what they need to do. And then hopefully in that space that's created, Hamas could do the one thing that could end this right away by releasing the hostages. Do you think that's likely? Well, of course I don't, which is why people calling for a, for a ceasefire right now uh, aren't engaging with the reality that actually that Hamas are unlikely to release those, those hostages anytime soon. So many but more they Palestinians could, will die. They could do it right now. It's in their power to do so. But what we can do is, with unanimity with our international partners, call for a humanitarian pause for however long it takes to make sure that we get the humanitarian support in there, okay. use that time wisely, and see if we can move towards a, a permanent cessation and then okay. move towards a political process. Uh, final question about Rwanda. Labour's plan for tackling the small boat crossings is to put more money into the National Crime Agency and, as Sir Keir Starmer put it when he wrote in The Sun the other week, smash the criminal gangs. How does that stop people getting in small boats? Like, talk me through what happens on the beaches in France. Uh, so th that's part of the plan you've just described. And of course, it's fully funded by using the money that's being squandered at the moment on a failing Rwanda plan. But that's part of the plan. The other plan no, is... No, no, I'm asking you a bit about the beaches. Like, you, well, you want to smash the gangs. So would, practically, what well, happens? Well, firstly, if we do smash the gangs, then that's going to stop a lot of people coming to the beaches in the first place. The second thing is we want safe passage. So we want to have a, arrangements so people can apply for asylum in safe countries. So so that they can apply for the process before they have to go to the beaches to get to Britain in the first place. So we're going to smash the gangs, we're going to speed up the, uh, the processing of asylum claims by hiring an extra thousand case workers. Productivity has fallen by 50% in the Home Office as it is. We're going to set up a new uh, task force within the National Crime Agency. We're going to carry on working on the, on the, the bilateral arrangements so we can re have return policies. We will work with our European neighbours to make sure we can continue moving forward with the, so the, under, the, the law enforcement. under a Labour government, should you win the next election, does that mean there'll be more asylum seekers in the UK? No, it doesn't, but because we'll have a functioning system, actually. The only thing that, showed that, that, that works as a deterrent, because I, I keep hearing the, the Prime Minister, uh, Rishi Sunak, saying that the Rwanda scheme will be a deterrent, but it hasn't acted as a deterrent at all. What we're seeing well, the, the, is... the boat arrivals are down this year. No, they're still up double what they were two years ago. OK. Um, so, you know, it, ha it hasn't acted as a deterrent. The only thing that is a deterrent is people knowing they're coming into a well-organised, a functional asylum-seeking okay. process, and if they don't qualify, they are returned swiftly. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. Thanks for talking to our audience, Mr Carr from Labour. Now, inflation fell sharply in October, down to a rate of 4.6% year-on-year. That is according to the latest official data published today. And Rishi Sunak says this means he has delivered on his pledge to half inflation. But how much credit does the government deserve for this outcome? And does it signal the economic outlook for UK households is finally brightening? Here's Ben. As you'll have heard, the rate of inflation fell sharply in October and the government says it's successfully fulfilled its promise to halve inflation in 2023. So is that right? What does it mean for the economy and what does it mean for you? First, on that halving question, this was inflation at its peak at the end of last year, 10.7%. Here's where it needed to get to. 
And here's where we are today, 4.6%. And presuming inflation doesn't spike up again in November or December, this is at least where we will end the year. So yes, it does look like inflation will halve in 2023. But the degree to which that's something for which Rishi Sunak can legitimately take credit when responsibly for controlling inflation has been handed over to the operationally independent Bank of England is questionable. It's also worth widening the lens to look at the UK's inflation picture through Newsnight's global tracker. As this shows, the UK, shown in pink here, still has the highest inflation in the G7, although now roughly level with France, and we're rather less of an outlier than we looked earlier in the year. And when we look at core inflation, so this is inflation stripping out volatile things like energy and food, the UK still seems to be suffering greater inflationary pressures than our economic peers. As for what it means for you, it doesn't mean most prices are coming down, but they are rising at a less painful rate than they were. If the rate of inflation continues to fall, the Bank of England might be able to cut interest rates from their current level of 5.25%, the highest in 15 years. That would give some relief to mortgage borrowers, yet those elevated core UK inflation figures we saw just now will mean the bank will be lightly wary of doing anything on that front for a while. And it's worth noting that the bank's latest GDP forecasts show a very weak outlook for the overall UK economy for the next two years, which implies a depressing outlook for household incomes. And while the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, is pleased to see inflation descending, this does not imply he will automatically have lots more money to spend on public services or tax cuts in next week's autumn statement, given that weakness of the wider economy and the government's self-imposed fiscal rules. It's fair to say most economists would regard today's inflation figures as good news, but not news that implies this big squeeze on our living standards is over. Well, you heard there how prices are rising more slowly. They're still going up, though. In the last 12 months, we've been following a community in Knowsley on Merseyside to see how their lives have been affected by the rising cost of living. Knowsley is the second most deprived borough in England. Last month, we went to see how Linda, Gary and Steph were gearing up for another winter of tight household budgets. I first came to Knowsley just before Christmas last year. Here, 25% of people are income deprived living on low incomes, with the area scoring well below the national average for young people in education or employment. And since 2015, life expectancy here has decreased. Gary runs the New Hut Centre, which recently celebrated its 60th birthday. It's a hub for the community and operates a social supermarket, providing everyday staples at heavily reduced prices to those in need. Demand is the highest they've ever experienced. So we would usually see summer, the warmer months, the demand slightly ease, ready for the winter months to increase. We've maintained that same level of support during the summer months that we did last winter. So inflation isn't rising at the same rate as it was. Energy costs have come down a bit. Why do you say people are finding it harder? They don't have the disposable income that they would have had in the past. Utility costs have gone through the roof, food costs have gone through the roof. Just those two things alone, for me, make a massive difference. What do you think is going to happen this winter then? Staff and costs have gone up. The cost to stock these shelves has gone up. So how can we be expected to meet double the demand on the same level of support that we've got? And now we are being expected to go back to pre-pandemic um, systems of applying for the funding. I.e. you're in competition with other organisations and you all have to compete for funding and, and some of you will lose out. Absolutely. What does this mean then for people around here, people in this community? So they will go without. Last time we met pensioner Linda, she told us she was limiting her heating to an hour a day and skipping meals but her pension has recently gone up. So compared to a year ago, say, how would you say your finances are now? It's still level and balanced out, even with the, the pension, because 
every the bills are just going up and up and all the food although it's gone up it's some ridiculous as prices it's not going to come down everything that goes up doesn't come down and we know there's going to be increases with the gas and the lecky and everything last time you and i chatted linda you said you were only having one meal a day and you were only putting the heating on for an hour is that still the same the heating's more or less the same but I am eating a bit more. I've got to with my health. I have lost weight. For Steph, a single working mum with two kids, she's now working an extra day a week, but isn't feeling a financial benefit. How much is childcare now? It's 50 pound a day and then Obviously, because I am I'm a single mum, I have 15 hours free. So my 15 hours cover uh, my Monday and half of my Tuesday. So then I have to fund half of Tuesday and my full Wednesday. So despite working an extra day, because of the extra cost of childcare for that day, you're not really any better off, are you? No, no. The money that I earn for that extra day covers my childcare. Mm -hmm. um, it also covers cost of living, the, the fight, the rise in food costs, it, and it covers a rent increase. The government's announced that from September 2025, working parents of children aged nine months and over will be entitled to 30 hours of free childcare per week until their kids start school. Whenever they decide they want to bring it in, our, our children are going to be already in school and, and times are hard now. So for me, work, work's my only option. But Right now, it's hard for me to go, well, actually, I want to go back full time because I cannot afford the childcare right now. We're, so if, if, they, if they would have brought the 30 hours in now, then I would have been happy to pay the extra day so I could have a full week in work. In a recent poll by YouGov, when asked what the most important issue facing the country was, 55% of respondents said the economy, a higher percentage than any other issue. So despite heightened tensions in the Middle East, a continuing war in Europe, and major decisions here today on immigration policy, still the biggest issue for voters is, do they feel any better off? And that's how many will judge our politicians ahead of the next general election. That's it from us tonight, see you tomorrow, good night.